My name is Michael Parks and I'm an artist and I've been an artist for a very long time. I paint, I make stone lithographs, I make sculptures, but most of all, I try to make something beautiful. And I'm hoping that I pass that on to you. My wife and I were art students and at 24 and 22, we uh, thought that we really weren't that good and didn't have that much to say. And the thing we were really interested in was uh, philosophy and metaphysics. So at that age, we thought we have nothing to lose, backpacks over the shoulder, a little money in our pockets, and we went off to find out, as uh, Paul Gauguin wrote in uh, one of his paintings around 1890, the title was, Where Did We Come From? Why Are We Here? And Where Are We Going? So those three questions, obviously, you can spend a lifetime trying to find the answers to. But we thought the best place to start was in India because the oldest records, the Vedas and the Upanishads, about 5,000 years old, would be a, a beginning place. And from there, we could follow the mysteries, I would say, forward all the way through Assyria, Mesopotamia, ancient Greece, Egypt, all the way up to the Renaissance in, uh, in Italy. So for 10 years, that's what we did. And at 34, we found ourselves in Spain, broke, my wife pregnant, and thought, hmm, maybe this is a good time to think about making a living. The only thing that I knew was painting. But now I had something to talk about. So I thought, all right, how do I translate all that we've learned in metaphysics into a visual medium so that people could experience it for themselves. And there were some fundamental problems. The first one was, how do you make magic happen in broad daylight? It's much easier when you have a black, all black painting and you have something coming out of the darkness. But if you have a bright sunny day, how can you make magic and mystery in that space? And the other thing was, how do you talk about things above human consciousness? You're in the realms of the angels, various divinities. And um, for that, I thought, okay, I've got to start with something. So I created certain costumes that had to do with um, making a kind of mysterious relevance. I realized that I could not put these characters in a normal space. In other words, I didn't want people to look at the painting and go, oh, we're in Egypt. Oh, we're in Greece. I wanted them to look and go, hang on. Where are we? What are these things? And there was one other element that fascinated me. We as human beings feel somewhat isolated. We are in a band of consciousness. And below us, we have the animal kingdom. And above us, we have this sort of unknown, mysterious, divine realm of, of angels, demigods, and ultimately some divine overview. And I thought, OK, how do you bridge those gaps? And one of the fascinating ones for me, and a, and a lot of fun, was creating characters that connected the animal kingdom with human beings. We don't have that smooth connecting link. There's not an animal there that we sit down in the evening and talk to. I mean, we talk to our dogs, they don't talk back. You can talk to a monkey, they respond, but not exactly the way you want. So that was the other element. And uh, I started... And it's been, <laughs> it's been a long time, uh, but I think ultimately I was able to achieve some of those goals of creating a, an atmosphere that is uh, uniquely timeless and characters that fit into that space and people respond to that. Very simply, drawing is the foundation of all of it. So the drawing is to take an idea and begin to make it real uh, so that other people can experience it. So that, that's the first thing. When I start drawing uh, an idea, I have a, a sketchbook where I have little thumbnail sketches of, it can be 20, 25, 30, that are that size. Then I take out of the 25 or 30 what I think are the best possibilities, which may be eight or nine, I blow them up to that size. Continue on down, three, up to this size. And then finally, when I think I have the best one or two, I go up to what would be the scale size for a painting. And that's more or less the process the way I work. Other artists do it completely differently, 
But the point is, drawing is the thought process that every artist uses to get to a point where you can develop the idea further. You can do that going into a painting, a stone lithograph, or ultimately a piece of sculpture. And I learned later on, because I started sculpture when I was 50, is that a drawing, which is two-dimensional, doesn't necessarily give you the information to make a three-dimensional image. And I had some real surprises when I thought, oh, this, would, this drawing would look great as a sculpture, only to find out that the front of the sculpture looked great, but I didn't have a clue what was going to happen to the rest of the sculpture. And so this was a whole other learning process. I was extremely lucky that uh, in 1980, I met a couple of artists that were well-known stone lithographers, uh, in, uh, they're uh, German artists, uh, Gunter Graus, uh, uh, as a Nobel Prize winning author, was also a, a stone lithographer, and Paul Wunderlich, also a, a fantastic artist, and um, uh, both of these men, considerably older, um, sort of helped me to get into the, the um, uh, the, the printing studio, because this was the last really big successful printing studio that handled artists and, and, and stone lithographs. And you had to have had experience in stone lithography to, to be able to go in. And I didn't. So I sort of lied my way in uh, to, to do the first pieces, but I, I got a lot of help and it was absolutely fantastic. The one thing about stone lithography is it's tremendously laborious. But you have a medium that, unlike etching, woodcut, or any, any other graphic um, uh, printmaking medium, is it's extraordinarily flexible. If you've got a good printer, you can do 10, 12, 14 colors. Uh, you can draw as finely detailed as you possibly want. You want full, rich blacks, no problem. And in my case, I even went further and printed with gold and silver ink, which had not been used in the process for many years. And I discovered it and, and, and started working with it. So the flexibility was incredible, but also the work was incredible. Every stone had to be, um, the color had to be separated. They all had to be registered. I drew every color. Uh, on every stone and then went through the whole printing process. So extremely complex and difficult, but extremely rewarding. The best part is, as an artist, you sit in your studio alone, months on end. You're creating ideas. Uh, uh, you really don't have anyone, no sounding board. You're, you're there with yourself and saying, is it good? I'm not sure. Was it better yesterday? When you're working in sculpture and in stone lithography, you've got a master printer, you've got a master uh, etcher that knows the stone intimately. These are living things, these stones, the, the 65 million year old Bavarian limestones but they have their own life, believe me, and they have their own quirks, and the, they change with the humidity and the air and the cold and so on. So to have somebody that knows the stones well enough to always etch them properly, and a, a printer that knows color intimately, that I, if I ask for a certain tone of red, and I want it to have just a touch of violet in it, but I don't want it too cold, I've got a printer that goes, okay, and off he goes, and he mixes the color. He might be off a fraction this way or that, but he is so close, it's just incredible. And to have that companionship when you're making art is something that I, I can't, uh, uh, it's been a tremendous joy uh, in, in my life as an artist. The term magical realism uh, started being connected with visual art around 18, uh, 1980, 82, something like that, primarily coming from literature uh, that, uh, that had this kind of fantasy, uh, uh, atmospheric uh, uh, play to it. But in the end, uh, it just kind of took on a life of its own. Other people said magic realism, there was fantastic realism, fantasy art, dream art, and on and on and on. And ultimately, every artist sort of had their own idea of what, what they should be titled. 
I think if I had it to do over again, I probably would consider myself a symbolist. I wouldn't consider myself any of those things. And for the simple reason that I have been in numerous books connected with other artists, and I don't fit. I've never fit. And although some of the artists I like very much, their, their work, there's really no connection at all. I'm the odd one out, and I've been that way my whole life. And um, that's why, like I said, if I had it to do over again, I think I would just start over and say, I'm a symbolist and leave it at that. There are paintings that I have painted that are specifically uh, an emotion, trying to create an emotion. Same thing with sculptures, which is much more difficult. Uh, something like uh, um, Summer Storm. Uh, you have a young angel uh, that is uh, protecting herself from uh, uh, the intense rainstorms that you can get in the summer. The wind is blowing her wings and you know the rain's coming right, right behind her, just moments away. And uh, it's, um, it's a feeling that sort of tugs at the emotions, especially if you remember as a child, this, this kind of hot day when all of a sudden the rain comes and, and, um, uh, and as uh, Lisa reminded me last night when I was talking about it, she said, you also said, that um, it's not just learning to protect yourself against the rain, but it's also learning to laugh and dance in the rain. So that kind of a, a, a simple emotional connection uh, I've done numerous times. But with the broad bulk of my work, I think the main thing that I've tried to do is to set a, a back, a, a, a ground, I say background, but I don't mean literally background like a sky or, or, or a wall. I mean an underground of calm. And this is done repeatedly over and over again because I want people, when they look at a painting of mine, they're strange. They're, they're, they're in a place that they don't know exactly where they are, but I want them to come in and not feel concerned at all because that's it. The window of a painting captures the viewer. And I'm well aware that capturing the viewer is based on setting a kind of balanced compositional calm. And within that context, I can talk about some very, very powerful symbols and some very, very strong things. So that would be, if there was one thing overall with my work, it would be this sense of calm. Even though there may be action, there may be things going on, but the overall impression is that kind of <sighs> nice calm. One of the things that consistently drove um, our research was uh, this connection with the divine creative energy and how it dominates so much of the early mysteries. And often this energy dominated in the early cultures, and but eventually uh, was destroyed by a, a more masculine dominant um, force. So my question was, if the feminine energy, this, this uh, divine matrix that, that uh, helps construct and build the universe as we know it in the, in, in, in the, um, the early uh, uh, Hindu and Vedic traditions indicate this, that, um, that it is the feminine energy that is the creative entity for the entire universe from the top to the bottom. As a matter of fact, the view that God is half masculine, half feminine in terms of energy and that, that dynamic, and the masculine stands behind and supports while the feminine uh, goes out and creates. Using this idea, then, um, I've spent a lot of time uh, trying to um, visually represent this creativity from the, uh, the angel worlds, the world worlds of the devas, which these are the creative uh, feminine beings that actually take energy, push it into matter, and design things. So these are creative designers. An example would be a deva that... Um, creates a frog. You take this energy and you push it into matter and you create a design and this design is a prototype but then it goes off and has a life of its own. It evolves, it matures, it changes and so on. So every thing on this planet 
uh, has been created in one form or another, and it has a not only a creator but a protector. I did a painting uh, called The Last Lion uh, in, in which I was representing this idea, and I've done it numerous times. Uh, there is a painting called Deva. But in Last Lion, um, it's very, very clear that she was the creator of the lion species. She followed it like uh, it's her own child through thousands and thousands of years, and now the lion has come to the end. The last lion literally being the last lion on this planet. And uh, I hope that that prediction is not correct, but we're getting there. And so she stands alone with her creation, the very last one, knowing that it's coming to an end. And to me, it's a, it's a, a very poignant moment because it is expressing, first of all, that the divine power to create and sustain has its limits, that we as human beings have the power to destroy and even the divine uh, creators have to stand aside and watch free will and evolution take its own course. And so this is a very strong philosophical statement when it, when it deals with the idea of what we, our responsibilities are as human beings because after all, if we are conscious enough to destroy the planet, then we should be conscious enough to take responsibility for it. So these, these devas uh, that have created our world, you can imagine what it must be like to watch slowly one by one their creations uh, being destroyed because nature is not destroying it. We are. I think uh, in terms of feeling successful, it happened over a very long period of time. So there wasn't a moment when I said, ah, I've made it now. It's, it's like putting bricks in a wall. You know, you don't say that brick is the one that makes the wall. It's step, 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 step. And you, you finally get to a point, but because I was living in Spain, Spain 40, 45 years ago was pretty primitive. And, uh, uh, and isolated. There was one phone in this small town. You had to book it in the morning and maybe you could use it by the afternoon. So if I wanted to make a call to anyone, it was that kind of a, a thing. And travel was not so easy. So when I started painting and there was a certain amount of success involved, uh, I didn't really know about it. And the, the person that was dealing with my work hesitated to tell me because it, it meant that I might I don't know what, become big-headed or so. I just didn't know. And I didn't know until actually several years later when I, uh, I had a, a couple of uh, shows uh, in America. And when I, when I had the first uh, show, and it was, we were on our way to Japan. So, and it was just a couple of quick shows in California. I had no idea. I, I walked into the show and there were already hundreds of people uh, standing in line. And, and I, it was several hours before the show started, and I was in there to sign some books. By the time I actually signed the books and the show was to begin, it was several thousand people. And to me, that was so overwhelming because I knew that I had clients that liked my work. We had started making posters, and I knew that the posters were being well-received. So I thought, okay, there are people out there that like my work. But I basically have I stayed in Spain, stayed out of the whole thing until this one experience that I had, and it was really, really shocking. And we had a flight at uh, midnight going to Japan, and um, the, the show was supposed to be over at nine, so we, had, we could get to the airport. There was still, I don't know how many, I'd say a thousand people still waiting in line, and I, I just, I, I could not quite believe it. So that to me was the one moment when I realized that something had happened with my work uh, as a kind of grassroots sort of thing that uh, was totally unexpected. And, I, and, <laughs> and it was really shocking, I have to say. Anybody that knows Lisa knows why I'm here. Her enthusiasm, uh, her attention to detail when it comes, I mean, this show is certainly the, the best show that I've had in this, this uh, trip of, of several exhibitions. It's uh, beautifully presented and in a way that um, makes the work 
every room has its own style. We're talking about uh, drawings in this room, paintings in the next room, stone lithographs, and the most difficult thing, sculptures interspersed where you can actually see the sculptures. But I think the, the most important thing is that Lisa likes the work a lot, which is fantastic for me, because if, if she likes the work that much, then it means that um, um, she has a way of expressing her like to the clients, and it really, really gives that extra um, um, feeling, emotional contact. Because there are many, many people that try to sell, uh, sell the work and they don't particularly like it. It's just something to sell. But here, it's personal. I think the thing is, is that, that um, I fir first met Lisa when she was working in another, another gallery. And um, she came to a show in uh, California and said, I'm, I'm opening my own gallery. I want, to, uh, I want to show your work. And I had no doubts because, uh, as you say, the, her level of energy when it comes to something she wants, that's the first thing, but also something that she loves. And I know that, that um, her connection with my work is personal, and so that makes it so much better uh, for me, and it also makes it so much better for the client, because when she is talking about the work, it is a personal thing with her, and she knows so much. As a matter of fact, uh, the opening last night, more than once, she finished my sentence when I was trying to explain something, and I'm going, she knows that. There's nobody that I know that knows that, but she knows that. So she's really, really, really done her homework, both as a collector of my work and now uh, uh, showing the work in the gallery. When we first arrived in, in Santa Fe, I was very interested to see uh, Lisa's new gallery, the Longworth Gallery and to see its location, because she had explained to me there was this lovely patio as you, as you look through, and then there were two separate galleries connected by this patio, and so she could show a diverse group of artists without one stepping over the top of the other, which is extremely important. I think she has done a, a brilliant job in presenting a more traditional view they, uh, it's sometimes called a museum presentation, which at my age, that is the way I would like to have my work shown. And, and she's done that. So you can see each work individually and calmly, and you're not, one is not fighting with the other. So I think the Longworth Gallery is a really good place to come.